All right. Vietnam. Don't worry about the name Frederick Downs. I mean, he was just an ordinary person who enlisted, got to be a second lieutenant. He enlisted with the intent of serving in Vietnam. He got over there and found that uh, it was not what he had thought it would be. He said the Vietnamese were lazy, and a lot of Americans felt this way. Now, folk, um, other people besides me have observed this. Vietnam is a tropical country, and tropical peoples are generally not industrious. North Vietnam was less tropical than South Vietnam. South Vietnam was more so. All right, and you might wonder why is that? I've tried to analyze it. If you live in a temperate climate, like we do, you have a certain window of opportunity where you have to plant. Now, if you're a farmer living in North Georgia, you have to plant between April 15th and May 30th, thereabouts. That's all the window you have. You might have well, but that's a wide window. If you live in Pennsylvania, you only have about a two-week opportunity to plant. And if you don't get planted, if you plant too early, the frost will get it. If you plant too late, the fall frost will get it. You've only got a small window of opportunity. And then when it comes harvest time, you've got to harvest before the frost comes. Or you've got to harvest while it's dry before the rain comes and rots your crop. And you've got to move whether you want to move or not. But if you live in a tropical climate, oh, you know, I'll plant when I get ready to, and I'll harvest when I feel like it. Whatever the reason is, a lot of your people, the Vietnamese people appeared to the American soldier to be lazy, and Frederick Downs could not tell, hey, am I doing the right thing, and am I, what am I fighting for anyway? Why am I here? He eventually was badly wounded, and had the, for him the war ended. He never fully recovered from his wounds, and folk, this happened to a lot of Vietnam War vets. The Vietnam War divided the nation as nothing else has ever done. World War I, we were united, even though eventually we got to wondering why we were there. But World War II, we knew why we were there, we were attacked. In the case of Korea, we wondered, do we have any business being there in the first place? In the case of Vietnam, it be, uh, Vietnam was the beginning of our wars that we've had to fight since, where that we gave the war goes on and on and on and on and on with no end in sight. The Afghan war began in 2001, 18 years later, it's still going on. No end in sight. Vietnam war, it's hard to tell when it began. It ended in January 1973, but it ended for the Vietnamese in April 1975, when North Vietnam actually won it. But it lasted at least 12 years, and during that time, we, those of us who lived through it wondered, is the war ever going to end? All right. When Kennedy took office, and again, you notice I'm backing you up because your book does. When Kennedy took office in January 1961, he made a remark that under Eisenhower, the whole country had grown soft. He said, I'm going to restore the country to strength again. And he began to do it, and he found out quickly why Eisenhower had stayed out of conflict. Castro take, took over Cuba. Castro found he could not be friends with the United States, so he joined up with the Soviet Union became buddy buddies with Khrushchev. Eisenhower began to train Cubans who had escaped. There was a lot of Cubans left Cuba, crossed the uh, Gulf to get to the United States, and they settled in Miami, Florida. Their descendants are still there. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans now living in Miami, and they all hate John Kennedy. Here's why. Eisenhower trained some of these Cubans to go in, and they were going to take Cuba from Castro. But Eisenhower left office before the Cubans were ready to go into Cuba. So Kennedy had to decide, do I let them go in or not? 
Kennedy told these Cubans, say, hey, you go in, and when you go in, the Cuban people will be glad to see you. They'll side with you. And in the meantime, we will support you with air support. We'll send our air fighters in, and we'll shoot at anybody who shoots back at you. Well, here's what actually happened. The Cuban invaders arrived from Miami. I mean, the Cuban people who lived in Miami went to Cuba and landed at the Bay of Pigs. Landed at the Bay of Pigs. Nobody in Cuba sided with them. The Cuban people seemed to like Fidel Castro. Nobody sided with them. Then Kennedy did not give this promised air support. Castro sent his army to fight the invaders. The invaders were badly beaten. It was a terrible black eye. And I thought this happened just three months after Kennedy took office. Kennedy took office in January 1961. In April 1961 came the Bay of Pigs fiasco. And this was a real black eye for President Kennedy. Kennedy was humiliated. The United States was humiliated. Latin America began to fear, hey, these Americans come to our countries anytime they want to. And this was true. Latin America was uh, alienated also. It took years to undo the damage that had been done. In April 1961 also, just a few days before the Bay of Pigs invasion, Soviet cosmonauts, a Soviet cosmonaut, I'm not going to try to spell that, but anyway, uh, astronaut. Except the Soviets called him cosmonaut. Anyway, a Soviet cosmonaut orbited the Earth. His name was Gargarian. That occurred earlier in April in the Bay of Pigs. And all this really, I mean, I lived through it. It was a terrible setback for the United States. Now, I was asked by a pupil this morning, why was the United States so concerned that it seemed like the Soviet Union was ahead of them? This is the reason. Today's wars are fought with technology. And it appeared to the American people that, hey, they are ahead of us technologically. Their equipment is better than ours. They have gotten to the space before we have, and uh, they, got the ast they got astronaut up there before we did. So they're ahead of us. So this was a terror to the American. Now, actually, the actual truth was the United States was far ahead of the Soviet Union technologically. All right, here's the type of race we're running. We're running a race to the moon to see who could be the first to the moon. As a result of this uh, orbiting of the Soviet cosmonaut, the United States set up the Apollo program. The Apollo program started off with Project Mercury that had one man in it. Project Gemini had two men. Then came Project Apollo that had three. Project Apollo got us to the moon. Now, <clears throat> I was told by a Lockheed employee one time when I was at Lockheed, give them credit, give them, they got there first. All right, I'll tell you how they got there first. They lost eight men and women, at least seven men and one woman, before they finally got one up and down. They would send their men off into orbit and lose them. They sent the next man up and lost him. This is like a suicide mission. Well, and also they would never announce they were there, but an Italian ham operator picked up the radio communications of these, and one time he picked up a heartbeat. He took the heartbeat to the doctor, and the doctor said, this is the heartbeat of a dying person. But we know, and we now have the names, they lost eight of their cosmonauts. They also, before this, they sent a dog up, and then told us, told the world, we're not gonna try to get the dog back down. Basically, they cheated. Now, when you're running a race with a cheat, the cheat will win initially. Yes, but in the long run, the cheat loses. In the case of Gargarian, there's no doubt he got up there. Our Navy was tracking him, and we knew that he was up, orbited the Earth once, and came down. No doubt. I mean, he actually orbited the Earth once. He came down once, so no doubt about it. But the Russians would not announce he had been 
even up there until they got him safely down to earth. Then they announced it. The thing about the eight persons they lost, the seven men and one woman, they never announced those at all until years and years later. Essentially, we were running a race with a bunch of cheats. We, were, we went about it slowly. We did not try to orbit a man. We sent our first man up, named Alan Shepard. Shepard only went th about 100 miles up and 300 miles out and came down. Just straight up and down. Then after that came Grissom. Now in the case of Shepard, he suffered burns on his body. So we got to figure out, well, what do we do about this? And we finally said, well, put magnets in a capsule, and that'll help. So the magnets warded off a bunch of radiation. So ever since then, we've had magnets in our capsules. So we sent Grissom up. Grissom went up, up about 100 miles and came down 300 miles down. Grissom's capsule got sunk, was not found until many, many years later. But uh, Grissom made a mistake in his landing. But anyway, Grissom made it up and down. Okay. But again, we announced all these beforehand. And also, we had cameras there, and everybody in the country was watching on TV. Our astronauts go up and then come down. Then John Glenn, he was the third one, orbited the Earth three times, came down. Wide open book, unlike the Russians. In the meantime, before John Glenn orbited, Tito, a Russian cosmonaut, orbited the Earth 17 times. In other words, they were out doing it, supposedly. Also, the Russian capsules were bigger than ours. But in the long run, our capsules got to be bigger than theirs. Well, make long story short, the Russians never put a man on the moon. We did. Six of them. Now, unfortunately, all the men who have ever walked on the moon, some of them have died of old age, and the rest of them are getting kind of feeble. I met one of them one time, astronaut Bean, who was on the second moon trip. Anyway, um, Bean is now deceased, I believe, and so is uh, Armstrong. So is John Glenn. And, but um, we eventually won a space race because our system was better than, our, than theirs. Now, you might wonder, what made our system so great? I'll tell you one thing that made our system great. We allowed for failure. All right, you may or may not know, Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player of his time. You may not know that he was cut from his junior high team two times for incompetence. Not that he violated the coach's rules. I mean, he wasn't that kind of boy, even as a youngster. His coaching staff did not feel like he was good enough to make the team. And he probably wasn't. But, and if he had grown up in Russia now, well, he'd only been cut from the team one time and never been allowed to try out again. If at first you don't succeed, you're gone for good. In our country, if at first you don't succeed, you can try and try again. Bob Cousy, who was a star ball player for the Boston Celtics, got cut from his junior high team two times. He made the pros as a star. If Bob, if Bob Cousy had been born in Russia, once he got cut, that would be the end of it. He's gone for good. We allowed a man to cut. To, now, I'm on a subject of athletics. Casey Stengel was a manager for the New York Yankees, later the New York Mets. One day, someone told Casey, we know of this ball player who played an entire season and never committed a single error. Casey said, forget it. Any player who doesn't commit an error isn't trying. Anybody who's played the game knows that if you're really trying, you're going to try for plays that you can only make maybe 50% of the time or can't make all the time. You're going to try anyway and sometimes louse up. It's called trying. One of my brothers was in the Army and his job was to listen in on radio conversations of the East Germans. And he said every time a radio operator made a mistake, never hear from that operator again. That was the end of it. What was the result? The only men the Russians had who made it to the top were mediocre men, men who didn't make mistakes along the way. The men who did make mistakes along the way kicked out. So only second-rate men actually got to the top. Hopefully I made my point, folks. 
Now, I don't know if that applies to 2019 or not. Maybe they've learned their lesson or so. But in those days, the Russian engineers, I mean, they, we had a, one of their top scientists defected one time, came to the United States. We tried to place him. We found out he couldn't do anything. He was so far behind us, he couldn't do anything that we were doing. Couldn't work with our engineers. Didn't know anything, but he was one of their top. Again, I don't know how too much this applies to 2019. All right. The Berlin Wall was put up. Folk, the Berlin Wall was not put up to keep Western Berliners out of that communistic heaven that had been set up in East Berlin. No. The Berlin Wall was put up to keep East Berliners from escaping into West Berlin. Because East Berliners kept wanting to get away, so they put up the wall, and it did a lot to slow down or stop East Berlin people from escaping to West Berlin. It did a lot to keep West, East Germans from escaping into West Germany. A lot of East Germans tried to escape, the Russians blocked them. The Berlin Wall was to last more than 20 years. Finally, Gorbachev had it taken down. That was years later. To strengthen the military, all men had to register with the draft at 18. As far as I know, this law is still in the books. I have one son, he registered at 18. There is no draft anymore, but basically when you turned 18, you, you went to the Selective Service and registered so the army would know where you were located and what you were doing. And you registered and uh, then the, uh, you were subject to being called up for the draft. And every month, you'd have to sweat it, every month they'd pull birthday dates out of a hat. And if your birthday came up, you were to be drafted that month. You'd get a notice that said, greetings. You are ordered from the President of the United States to report to such and such a place and um, you were expected to go and report for a physical. A lot of men failed the physical, but if you passed the physical, you were sworn in and inducted into the Army for a two-year hitch. Now, if you volunteered, it was four years. If you were drafted, you could serve for two years. And a lot of draftees wound up signing up again. The draft lasted from the time you were 18 to the time you were 26. Now, I know I said you first had to sweat it every month. If, you're not, if your birthday came up really high this month, it might come up low next month. Now eventually what they did was they had to put everything, everybody from 18 to 26 into one big lottery and pulled out your birthday. You only had to sweat it one time. Now in my case, I got to my birthday came up for number 206 and the draft boards were told they could not draft beyond 190 that year. So. I got out, of course, I later on, re I later joined after the war was over. I later joined and joined the Army in 1980. But, um, like I say, um, I never had to go to Vietnam, even though a lot of my classmates did. And one of my brother's classmates was killed in Vietnam. One of my classmates was wounded, but he recovered. Kennedy also got the Peace Corps started. This is a draft age, 18 to 26, Peace Corps. You don't hear much about it anymore. The Peace Corps was where that um, you, um, young people, men and women both, would volunteer to go to a um, foreign country a developing country, and try to bring them up to American standards. They were hated. A lot of them were arrogant. But they were sent to countries like Jamaica, Haiti, Honduras, and those countries, trying to bring them up to American standard of living. And um, a lot of times, Americans had no idea what they were talking about either. Uh, you had to learn their language and learn their customs. In some cases, they did some good. In most cases, though, they wound up I mean, hey, folk, the people in Jamaica know how to farm Jamaican land better than I do. The people living in Jamaica know better how to farm Jamaican land, probably better than most of us do. 
and also the people in Jamaica know how they can get their people to work better than I do. I mean, hey, the problem these people had, and like for instance, if they might get a job at a local factory, but in the meantime they set a fish trap, and every day on the way to work they check the fish trap for a fish. If there were no fish in it, okay, I've got to go to work to get some money to feed my family, so we go to work. If he looked at the fish trap and there were big fish inside, uh oh, I don't have to go to work today. Pick up the fish trap, take the fish home, and have his wife make a big meal or two meals for his family. He didn't have to go to work that day, he caught his fish. You might say, why didn't he go ahead and go to, he should have set the fish, why didn't he go ahead and go to work? He didn't think he had to. The idea of working, saving money, and getting ahead, well, hey, fooey on that. If he didn't have to go to work, he wouldn't. This was the, the way these people lived, and the American people had a hard time understanding that. All right. The biggest arms race in history, the United States and the Soviet Union trying to outdo each other, building more and more nuclear weapons. The, the Soviet Union built more of them. They had more tanks and more planes and more submarines than we did. They didn't have more nuclear weapons though than we did. But here was the problem with them. Their tanks did not work. Their planes were not as good as ours. Their artillery was not as good as ours. And this showed up when Israel and the Arabs would fight. The Arabs got their weapons from the Soviet Union. Israel got its weapons from the United States. And Israel just tucked and puffed and blew the Arabs off the battlefield. It wasn't that simple, but you get the idea. Uh, again, because the, the weapons the Israelis were using was better than the weapons that the Arabs were using. Anyway, this leads us up to the biggest crisis of the Cold War. But folks,